Well, welcome everybody. It's 1.15 on Tuesday, September 15th. And this is the General Housing Military Affairs Committee of the Vermont uh, General Assembly. We are picking up our work on S-237, which has been titled, um, as long as we've been working on it, as an act relating to affordable housing. And um, we have had several weeks of testimony on this bill. Uh, it has been a lot of hard work on this committee to try to grasp a hold of some of these issues that have been um, discussed and that were promulgated in this bill. And uh, we have essentially run out of time on threading a needle towards any potential compromise between what we might think is is good policy though others may not agree that it's good policy uh, but we have uh, come to the point where we need to uh, take action on this bill if we are going to see any part of it move forward um, i have asked ellen to provide us with a stripped down version of the bill we started this work on third when we started this work on thursday we did do a section by section and it was for this purpose basically was to really identify what the problematic sections were and to see what the interplay was between them and to see if there was a way for us to make it work but it's clear that um, we can't um, it's clear that there are issues in here which uh, are, are important um, they were important enough to be put in a bill in the senate and passed unanimously through the Senate, um, and yet, as we've tried to take, to, as we have taken testimony on it, it's clear that there are plenty of um, questions that have come up, both with, um, both with the um, whether our committee is the right committee for for any particular section, or whether the language itself is there um, is is ready to be instituted. And so it's clear after testimony um, leading up through last Friday that there are sections that just we should not consider for this particular biennium in this in this shape and form because of the, um, the lack of time. Um, when discussing this with the speaker um, since last week, it's clear that um, from my from my experience um, a bill like this that comes to us so late needed six hours a day not just six hours a week of work on it to truly get to the the core of what we were trying to do and in discussions with um, committee and in discussions with um, witnesses there is a feeling that uh, there are other committees that need to weigh in on elements of the bill that um, and that's true. It's, you know, this this bill came to us because it said it was a bill relating to affordable housing. And I think we all identified pretty early on that it's a bill about zoning and to try as we might to um, to try to get a handle on it all. There is, I think I've come to the conclusion and I would say that there's a probably a consensus of some sorts here that there is um, that there is there are large areas of clarification needed when it comes to this particular subject matter. Zoning is not easy. Um, the testimony we took from uh, natural resources showed that there is a tension that I think is in our committee, but there is a tension between protection of natural resources and historic settlement patterns and you know and add in the things that we've discussed with this bill which includes traditional zoning and and lot size and trying to do infill development within traditional um, building patterns and so with that i again took the took the liberty to go through the bill with the um with ellen and uh, identify areas that were um, that possibly could be um, considered you know possibilities for us but Ellen if I could ask you if the first document can be the the document as we worked on as we've been the strike all from last week I think it would be helpful for us to go through this again quickly and I can I can um, 
lead the conversation in terms of the decision I made to ask you to, to build the next document, which is, um, which is a strike all as well. Does that work for you? Sure, do you want me to put that, you want me to share my screen now and put that document up? Um, yeah, actually in a minute, does anyone have any questions before we go through this bill? And, and I, you know, again, I'm presenting this in a way that is, you know, based on, you know, based on an honest hearing of the testimony that we received and an honest, really, you know, looking at the, th there were no easy solutions to any of the problems that uh, with this bill that came up um, in discussion. And, and we don't have six hours a day for a couple of weeks to hammer out the right language that would make this work and to share it with different committees that would make it work. And so um, I present, I'm gonna present this, you know, going through this bill and say, this is why I'm, I am proposing to do X to it and, um, but leave it up to the committee to have an open discussion um, when we're done with the walkthrough and, uh, and have an honest discussion over whether, whether the suggestions I'm making are, are right or not. It's not, I'm not claiming any um, ideological ownership of, of the language that's left in, in, in the decisions I made. So, so Ellen, if you could post that. And Alan, if you can just remain, you know, on unmuted, so that if I get something wrong, um, please feel free to chime in and and just let me know. Okay, so, so this is the strike all from from last week, draft one point one, and it was posted a couple of days. Um, it was posted on the tenth, or yes, it was posted on Thursday and Wednesday and possibly also Tuesday. So it was posted just one, just Wednesday and Thursday last week, so. All right. So um, some of this conversation on these things was informed by a conversation that I had with um, a further conversation that we had after the testimony from Representative Dolan and Representative Sheldon from the Natural Resources Committee who had expressed their, um, their feelings that because this falls in, into Title 24, which is really their, one of their um, pieces of their portfolio. Um, and that's true for quite a bit of the zoning conversation that we're that we're going to have today. So section one is about um, the changes that were inherent in section one or in 19 and lines 19 and 20 that had to do with um, water supply lines. And while I, you know, we feel like there that this section was um, that this section had had been created in such a way that was not going to be expensive and not going to be onerous to the municipalities, it's a zoning issue. Um, and so I would propose that we cut section one and, and allow this um, section of the bill to be dealt with next year um, through a different bill. Section two. Um, section two A, um, has to do with the, while well, this is zoning um, as well, this has to do with the accessory dwelling units and the ability to this, that what this language did was um, it allows a, a single family dwelling unit to be subject to the same reviews as other um, single family dwellings without a unit. And it changes the requirements for square footage. And it basically loosens the uh, regulations on accessory dwelling units and allows accessory dwelling units to be built on one, an owner occupied property 
um, as long as it meets, matches other zoning requirements that already exist. And I will propose that we keep this section on accessory dwelling units. Um, section. So we're, um, I'm sorry, go ahead with the next section. And that goes through existing small lots. And that change um, does not change the um, one eighth acre areas, but it does change. It just does says that a municipality may prohibit development of a lot not served by and able to connect to municipal sewer and water service. So it actually tightens that up a little bit, um, allowing a municipality to um, limit building on lots at this size. Section 2B, line 16 is, um, and so my proposal is to keep 2A. Um, section six, uh, line 16, um, inclusive development, I propose to cut that whole section. So Elena, if you could just scroll through. That cuts the parking, cuts a substantial report, a substantial um, report because it's not necessary at this point in time. This is a substantial municipal constraint report. It cuts the incentives. Okay, we can stop there at section three. Section three is um, proposed to keep section three. Um, again, while this is zoning um, under in conversation with um, the folks from natural resources, they did not have a, um, they did not have uh, an objection to this, uh, adding this on here. And this has the character this was a this was a piece of of language that um, many people had opposed to when it was a larger line, but no one natural resources committee did not have a problem with it as as defined. Um, the section four is related to section two b, so I would propose that that be removed. Section five is also related to 2B. So I would suggest that, that I would propose that that be deleted. Section six is also related in part to um, the changes proposed in section 2B. So I would propose that that be removed. Section, this section six of enumeration of powers is, um, this is the language that would allow a municipality to regulate by ordinance um, or bylaw the operation of short-term rentals. It's not a mandate, but it allows municipalities to, um, to create bylaws if they so wish about the um, that does not adversely impact the availability of long-term rental housing. So that means that this allows them to, um, to create bylaws on short-term rentals, which we know have been uh, a huge issue in many municipalities of so the creation of that. So this would allow municipalities the right to do, um, to do their own bylaws on this. It's not a statewide, um, it's enabling legislation. And as we discussed, I think, last year when we were discussing recovery residences, I just want to point out that on line 18 and 19 kind of gives you the idea of what a short-term rental is and, and how it interplays with um, what we know of short-term rentals and 
I think anybody who has a second home or, a, and I think Representative Walls, you had commented that when you have in the past rented out, it, you, you paid close attention to the 30 consecutive days or, and for more than 14 calendar, days per calendar year as a, as a real standard that's not changing, but it really defines what a short-term rental is. Um, in the next section, um, section seven, I would propose it to be cut. There, these are um, tax credits. I was, um, while this is a technical change on this first one, I would propose to change it. I was um, personally under the uh, impression that some of these tax credits and discussions over tax credits had been a little bit more um, baked than they are. And this section on tax credits has to do with ways and means and ways and means has not weighed in on, um, in fact, they made decisions earlier to, while they made decisions earlier this year to extend um, some of the tax credit programs related to, related to this downtown and village center, um, they did not weigh in or they did not create tax benefits for flood mitigation um, and so I would propose that because this has to do with, um, in this case, this has to do with, um, as we'll see if we script, well, this actually stopped right there, Ellen. So line seven, this has to do with neighborhood development areas. And that was not approved with the tax benefits that were, um, that were discussed in ways and means. And so while I interpreted this earlier on over the last several weeks as being a technical change, it's actually, it actually seems to be more of a policy change, which is a policy that, that goes through ways and means. Okay, moving on. And then we stop here at, at definition six. Um, Representative Dolan testified on behalf of the Natural Resources Committee that um, she was troubled by on line 15, the concept of non-structural changes being allowed under uh, as a, as a potential tax benefit and um, essentially asked that we not include that when it considers tax benefits. But if we're not considering tax benefits at all under these circumstances, then the section would just get cut along with everything else um, in the section. So continue to go scrolling down. Um, this section is um, proposed to be eliminated as well. And that brings us to the to mobile home parks. Um, I would propose that we uh, retain this section. Um, the version that we're looking at with the highlighted yellow material represents what had been put in at the suggestion of Commissioner Walk, but we had a conversation with Commissioner Walk after this bill was, after this particular version was was written and so we had different language of where it said restructuring or forgiveness and um, to allow for improvements to drinking water wastewater on line eight here so that will show up in the slender, slender version of, of this bill um, so I would propose that we keep this bill this is incredibly important to the town of Brattleboro and to the tri park um, cooperative in order to move forward with their master plan um, with these, I'm sorry, can you scroll back up? And this is something that I didn't share that's not in the, um, that's not in the, the next version of this bill, but um, Natural Resources did request to be included in the, in section B, um, where the reports would be um, issued to Senate Economic Development and House General, as well as the Institutions Committee. Um, so if that, that'll be a change that I would suggest in the next version of the bill as well. Going down to, to the next section. And Lisa, we'll get to you when we, we're almost done with the walkthrough here. Um, this is section 11 is tied to section 10. This allows the treasurer to use her discretion um, to use amounts available to provide financing for infrastructure projects in mobile home parks and may modify the terms of such financing. So that's this is of a piece with section 10. And um, implementation of incentive section 12 is moot because there are no incentives. 
remaining in the bill if we accept the proposals and then the effective date um, would have to change and we have a suggestion for that. So those are my proposals for this. Um, bill, Ellen, if you could just switch over to the next, um, to today's version of the bill. Representative Hengo. Thank you. I just had a quick question. Um, after all of our discussion, you did follow up with um, Commissioner Walk and they were comfortable with including forgiveness for the- um... Yes, he testified. I didn't follow up with him. He testified at the end of, at the end of his hearing that he would be comfortable with the phrasing um, or forgiveness, not and, but or forgiveness. Okay, I guess I missed that. Thank you. Um, will we be going through a walkthrough of the bill as it now looks with Ellen? Um, because I haven't had a chance to read it through That's yet. all. That is teed up, ready to go. And Ellen is here. Okay. Um, the first thing I think I'll point out from a, just from a you know what this represents in terms of space is that it's a 20 page bill that's gone down to seven because of the amount of material that's been uh, proposed to be deleted and um and actually because of the deletions of all the zoning the title of the bill essentially remains the same because basically what's in here is about accessible uh, accessory dwelling units and mobile homes so with that, um, uh, committee, just uh, nod of your head. Are you okay with Ellen moving on to the quick walkthrough of what's left in the bill? Um, be actually, before we start, I also just want to put out there um, because of be because of the um, removal of the language from the budget in an amendment on Friday about the rental registry. Uh, what that has done is um, put us in a place where I do not believe that adding material from H739 to this bill is beneficial at this time. It raised enough questions about whether or not um, the registry program would be even done. Um, my understanding from uh, Commissioner Hanford's testimony was that it was um, because of the hiring freeze, because of the uh, loss of capacity within the department and the questions raised by, um, by us, by committee members, um, and as well as, as the reality of having a December 30 deadline or really a December 20 deadline for expending the money, um, there was no guarantee that a program of registry being developed we using uh, coronavirus relief funds would be able to get done. And that's just a simple, you know, that's just, there was nothing in the testimony that changed from that over the weeks. And so I would also propose that this bill not include language relating to H739. Um, and we can have that conversation after this walkthrough of this particular bill as well. Ellen, take it away. Okay, so uh, posted for under today's date on your committee page is draft 3.1 of the strikeout and it reflects the changes that we just discussed um, that Representative Stevens just uh, walked through with you. So here, it, here is what the strikeout now looks like. Section one starts with amending 4412 of Title 24. Uh, you'll notice first that there is no longer a sub A on line 10. Um, that was purely added to address the inclusion of the new um, uh, subdivision B, which was the inclusive development. So that is struck. So uh, the first, so this change, uh, this section now just includes the change to the accessory dwelling units, and then the existing small lot provision, which is on the next page. So first, the accessory dwelling unit definition um, is changing slightly, um, although it hasn't, your committee hasn't adjusted it, but this, um, as the chair just mentioned, expand uh, what an accessory dwelling unit can include. It can be on an owner-occupied lot, 
subject to the same review as a single family dwelling and doesn't have to be an efficiency or a one bedroom. It also allows it to be up to 900 square feet or 30% of the single family unit, whichever is greater. Um, and then this language is struck, uh, which previously allowed additional bylaws to provide um, for conditional use of accessory dwelling units. And we are striking that, um, but we are allowing bylaws to regulate short-term rental units distinctly from residential units. So that's the ADU language. Uh, then on page three, we have the existing small lot provision. Um, a municipality may prohibit development on a lot not served and able to connect to municipal sewer and water if it is less than one acre or has a uh, dimension width or depth, depth of dimension of less than 40 feet. So that is section one. And then section two includes the language regarding the character of the area. Um, it is in 4414, which is permissible zoning regulations. So we're in the section that discusses conditional use regulation. So the new language uh, says a multi-unit dwelling project consisting of four or fewer units located within a district allowing multi-unit dwellings may not be denied solely due to an undue adverse effect on the character of the area affected. And by, and just to be clear, the word solely here is what's important. Um, it, it, like a lot of our statute, it doesn't just, it, it allows for denial if there are other reasons, whether it's capacity permitting or, or um, or other issues that may prevent it from being built. That's there. We're just saying here that it's only on this. If it's only about this issue, that it can't be prohibited. Right. Or and some of those some of those standards are here above the page. Uh, this is the section that lays out how a municipality can use the conditional use review procedure. And so um, they are allowed to adopt conditional use review that includes reviewing the capacity of existing and planned facilities, character of the area, traffic, um, other bylaws in effect, and utilization of renewable energy resources. So these are the other, some of the other standards that, th that they can uh, evaluate a project. And so denial can happen for any of these other reasons. Okay. And again, Representative Hanger, we'll wait till the end of the walkthrough before we get to Um, section three is the language regarding uh, municipalities having the ability to adopt a bylaw related uh, regulating short term rental units. Hey, can you can you scroll up just for a second, just to, just to let us again look at look at that. Um, yep. So section so this section starts at the bottom of page four. So we're, we're still in Title 24, uh, 2291 is the section that has all of the um, powers that municipalities have the ability to use when adopting ordinances. So we're adding this new language, Subdivision 29, as um, giving, the, giving a municipality the ability to adopt a bylaw regulating short-term rental units. And then we switch to the mobile home park section, sections. So section four has the, um, the session law provision related to the town of Brattleboro and Tri Park and the Department of Environmental Conservation. So, um, so the language does now include that phrase. So the Department of Environmental Conservation shall assist the town of Brattleboro and the Tri Park Cooperative in implementation of the Tri Park Master Plan and Deerfield River and Lower Connecticut River Tactical Basin Plan, including through restructuring or forgiveness of state revolving loans and additional loans to the extent possible 
to allow for improvements to drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure needs. Um, and then uh, to uh, provide similar uh, assistance to the extent possible to similarly situated mobile home parks that also have infrastructure needs. Um, uh, there's a piece of highlighting here because I deleted the phrase small, uh, small communities, I believe. Yep. Yep. Um, similarly situated. Uh, oh, and reloc uh, relocation was also deleted. Mm -hmm. So um, that have uh, mobile homes, parks that also have relocation or infrastructure needs. Um, and then three. Oh, this is where I deleted other small communities. So um, identify statutory and programmatic changes necessary to assist the implementation of the plans and to improve access and terms by mobile home parks to the clean water revolving loan fund water infrastructure sponsorship program and drinking water state revolving fund. So there was also the inclusion of other small communities was here. Um, section five is the language about the state treasurer. There um, has been no change there. Oh, back, sorry, back um, in subdivision B, the, the chair just asked to add House Natural Resources to the list of um, committees that's going to get the report from the department on the actions taken related to Tri Park. So I'll have to add um, down here on line six and seven, uh, house Natural Resources. Um, and then um, the effective date. So section six, uh, this shall take effect on passage. And that changed simply because a, a July one has already passed. You had put in December one as a placeholder. Yeah. And the 2023 date is unnecessary because we've taken out those sections. Yes. Okay, I have two questions right now, Representative Hango and then Triano. Thank you. Um, section two, I just want to be really clear about that, that that's about municipal bylaws. That's about the um, zoning plan that a municipality has already set up or will be setting up in the future. Um, and those municipalities who don't have any type of plan like that, this doesn't really address um, situations in those communities, or does it? Uh, right. This is only for communities that are using conditional use review as adopted um, by their town um, and then are using the conditional use review on multi unit dwellings specifically. And my second question, thank you, is um, the short-term rental section three. Um, there's language that says will adversely affect long-term rentals. Who is the determinant of that and what are the determining factors of adversely affecting long-term rentals? Ellen, are you there? Yes, I'm. Uh, so I'll find it for you. Um, I, well, um, so from a procedural, I think I, I think it maybe isn't specifically clear, but procedurally, when a municipality is going about adopting this bylaw, they will have to use this authority when adopting it, and so they'll need to take this language into consideration. And if they, uh, if they do not 
if someone challenges the bylaw, they will ha um, have to demonstrate that they have met this standard. And I think that's all I, they'll have to provide evidence of that. Who is they, the person challenging or the municipality defending? So the municipality will have to establish um, through their bylaw um, process um, that they have met this standard. And, and if they are subject to a challenge, the evidence they have um, on, the, on their record in adopting the bylaw will be, um, will have to meet this. I guess that's a little vague. Um... And I'm just thinking, you know, if a municipality has plenty of um, housing for rent that is long-term housing, then I would think that they meet this challenge that, that they would be okay under this statute. But I'm, I'm not certain that this protects a municipality that has a lot of available housing already. Well, this is, again, this is enabling regulation, or this is an enabling statute. This does not force a community to adopt these standards, but if the community wanted to, then this is the standard that they would achieve. This is what they would use to do that. Right now, a community cannot easily or cannot regulate in this manner. And so if there is a community, as you describe it, then they may not be interested in adopting this bylaw at all. So it's not a state mandate. It's just something that allows, there are going to be communities that, you know, we've, we've used the phrase cookie cutter um, in, in, in different ways. And this is one of those things where this is not a cookie cutter. This is, this is allowing a municipality who has these regulations in their bylaws to, um, to achieve this. Okay, great. Thank you. I think I missed the word shall in the page before that. So thank you. A representative Triano, then Gonzalez. So uh, am I hearing this right, that now under the mobile home section that we will, it will be a combination of relocation and infra infrastructure improvements in Brattleboro? Is that what we're, where we're at right now? Rather than relocating and shutting down the park? No, 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 it's, it's relocation is, is the, the concept of relocation is out of the bill. Okay. Okay. And it basically talks about, in this particular case, um, you know, the first three lines talk about assisting in the implementation. Yeah. The next three lines talk about including through, so processes that can be considered would be restructuring the loans that exist or per perhaps, or perhaps forgiveness. Um, as opposed to and, as, as was discussed on Thursday, of these particular loans um, and additional loans to the extent possible, to the extent possible being the, it may not be possible, um, but that these loans that are um, the restructuring and other processes could allow for the improvements to the drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure needs. There's no, we had to take out the conversation about relocation because um, most, if not all, in uh, funding that would happen for relocation would come through the federal government and not through these particular loans. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. And Dion, are you okay? You had your hand up? Yeah, it was just about the, the um, short-term regulations, but I'm good, thank you. All right. So again, I present these as proposals. Um, uh, you know, we have put a lot of work into this bill to try to, uh, as I said earlier, to try to make it um, broader, but this is not the time for that. And, um, and so I would open up the floor to conversations um, on the bill in, in total. We have, as, as we have for the last week or so, we have invited um, various advocates to be on hand as if they were in our committee room. And that includes um, Chris Cochran from, from um, DHCD, 
and Erhard Manka from Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition and Alan, Alex Weinhagen from, and I, am, I, am I still butchering your name, Alex? Um, and you have it right. Is, it's a Hagen, not a Hagen. Um, Either is fine, Hagen is a little more German. Okay, um, and so uh, I will open the floor to us all and start with um, Representative Byrong, then go to Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess my it's kind of a broad question. So the parts that we've removed, like such as parking and uh, the constraint reports and whatnot, has that moved over to whatever they're working on in natural resources? Or is that being removed from the totality of these conversations? I'm sorry. Sorry, did was that not clear? I hold on a second. I'm turning off my video for a minute because I my my thing is unstable. So was the question, is this language going to a different place right now? Yeah, that was just kind of my question. I, I understand that it's removed from in front of us. I'm just curious if it's still existing in a conversation somewhere else. Um not that I'm aware of. I mean okay. there's as as you all recall from this bill, you know, this was this was part of a bill that was meant to include other Act 250 issues. Um, and while these are not directly related to Act 250 issues, they were part of that bill. I, it's not clear to me that, well, what's clear to me about H926 is that it does, is not gonna include any of this material. And so okay. we're, not, we're not punting this language over to any place to be considered this week. Um, my understanding is that this language will be um, filed away and perhaps utilized uh, in the next biennium. Okay, because I, my curiosity was around the parking conversation, the constraint reports, and things of that nature. I understand that they were removed from the content of the sections that we are still working on. I just was curious if they were winding up in the content as it got moved to another committee, but it does not sound like that's. The no, case. we're not. We're not moving. We're we're responding to other committees' concerns about this uh, material in terms of, in terms of that. And again, if we had more time, um, we perhaps would have been able to call on the right witnesses or have the joint committee hearings that we would have needed to work on this bill um, in that way. But right now, it's clear that we don't. Um, and so regardless of, of the, I think at this point, regardless of the quality of the conversation, um, we, we're, gonna, we're just moving on from it. Okay. Nope, thank you for clarifying that, I appreciate it. Yeah, okay, Alex. Hi, so Alex Weinhagen, um, legislative liaison for the Vermont Planners Association. Uh, first, just thanks to everyone for trying to thread the needle on, on the pieces of this bill that really didn't pose much controversy and, and do need to move forward. Uh, my, my only uh, parting suggestion is that there was one section that was struck. Um, it was section three of the original Senate bill, section four of, this, of the earlier strike hall in your committee related to covenants um, and deed restrictions that uh, was stricken from this latest version, but doesn't need to be. Um, there is only one minor reference to um, section B, which has been removed in that section. Um, and if that phrase referencing it were removed, it would still uh, make sense, be intact and be consistent with what the Senate ver uh, version was looking to do. And what it was simply looking to do is to make sure that some of the provisions in the bill, like the accessory dwelling unit allowances, will still remain possible in the face of uh, potentially restrictive homeowners association language that can actually make those impossible. Um, so right now, even if a municipality allows for an accessory dwelling unit consistent with state law, a homeowners asso association in a new development that's being proposed can eliminate the ability to do accessory apartments. And we had such a case in my community uh, which was really unfortunate where a homeowner came to us, got a zoning permit consistent with our regulations, and then was uh, told that they were gonna be taken to court by their own homeowners association if they followed through with that accessory apartment. So I'm, I would just advocate that you consider re uh, reinserting that section um, and just just subtracting that phrase that refers um, to the piece that that is no longer part of the bill. Um, and 
going forward, that would allow at least the accessory dwelling units and perhaps other uh, positive municipal land use regulations to, to be possible for all people, regardless of whether they live um, under the auspices of a, of a homeowners association. Alex, before I, before I ask Ellen about that um, directly, can you tell me offhand like what the relationship between a homeowners association bylaws and a condo association bylaws are? Because uh, my experience in the past with condominium law is that it's very, very difficult for state law to insert itself within condominium law. And I'm just curious, does, does homeowners, does homeowner association um, statute or what have you is it's more federally, I mean, the condo stuff is more federally based and it's really hard for the state to, to like I said, to, um, we tried to we tried to pass legislation ten years ago that that got into that and um, we were told no you can't change it because it's it's a you know the it's condos are their own they're their own world um, do homeowners associations still fall under that as well uh, so the short answer is I'm not sure uh, so I, I I think of them as the same in my years of of municipal um, land use work. Uh, I, don't, I have not seen a difference or heard an attorney argue that there's some difference between um, a homeowners association that might govern eight lots uh, who share a road and perhaps some open space and um, eight condominiums on a, on a common piece of ownership uh, land. I'm not sure there is a difference. Um, what I would point you to, which I mentioned in the past, is the legislature's uh, uh, work on closed lines of all things, energy efficiency measures, and the law that was passed that prohibited uh, associations and deed restrictions limiting the use of, of those sorts of energy efficient technologies, as old as those technologies are, like closed lines. Um, and I think that set precedent um, that the state could uh, monkey with uh, private deed restrictions and association covenants. And this section of the bill that passed through the Senate um, does the same thing, but in a broader way, um, so that these housing provisions that both the state and the municipal municipalities are, are looking to allow to give homeowners the ability to provide more housing um, actually remain possible. Keep in mind that, at least in my community and, and probably more in the urban to suburban areas of the state, uh, homeowners, homeowner association developments are the norm. Um, it, we don't see as many uh, purely single-family homes on public streets that have that have no sort of deed restrictions and and common interest ownership provisions. Most of them, especially for mid to larger size projects, do. And so there's a real concern, at least in my sector, that um, these covenants can be used to to undermine uh, the 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 housing uh, goals that both the state and our municipalities have. And. Okay, no, fair enough. Um, Ellen and then Lisa. Ellen, do you have um, comments on, on that section? Uh, sure, so as it was drafted, the deed restriction language was specific to uh, 4412B1. It originally didn't include the ADU language. So you can, you can put it back in there and actually have it specific to any section I would just ask which sections you are being specific to so which sections would you like to um, prevent restrictive covenants on which which section like 4412a or which like like if yeah. we if we said ADUs yeah there's I could I mean I could insert that specific citation okay um, Representative Hango. So I'm not convinced that we need to add that back in um, just because I've lived in a number of places across the country and um, covenants and, and deeds have their place for a lot of people um, um, for a lot of different reasons and none of them being the, the malicious type reasoning that Mr. Weinhagen was just alluding to. Um, so I, I kind of do take exception to that because it's not a planned 
way of in excluding certain folks, um, but it is uh, a way, a planned way of um, um, a mutual. I'm sorry, I just, I, I, Lisa, I unmuted, I muted you by accident. Can you, I meant to lower your hand. Can you unmute yourself? I'm Thank laughing you. because that might have been intentional. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just, I just feel that um, sometimes planned communities like this are for the mutual benefit of of folks who who choose to live together in a certain um, in a certain atmosphere. For instance, you know, like they want to preserve being able to um, look at farmland around them or have a view of the mountains or, or whatever it is, people are coming together to have a development. So I really think that that might be reading a lot too much into it. And I'm not in favor of adding that language back yet. Thank you. Okay, Representative Kalaki. Well, I think Alex presents an interesting issue that to be consistent, um, it, it, I think there's a strong point to, to do that. And it's only about, as I understand it, we can, we can say it's consistent for the ADUs. So I don't really see if, as long as we're clear about what that is, it's actually gonna allow the state, the municipals and the homeowners to understand the enabling language and the framework of this. So I, um, you know, I would love to see what this looks like, this, this extra paragraph. And Ellen, if you can, I would suggest be very clear, as you said, Ellen, to make it about the ADU stuff that we're talking about. And then I think the bill is clear what we're trying to do. And, you know, Chair, I appreciate the work um, you've done and everybody who's on this, uh, you know, we're about ADUs, about conditional use, short-term rentals, which is in some parts of our state really problematic. We're letting the municipalities decide what to do about that. And then the mobile home infrastructure. I mean, these are four key things that were um, in, important for the state and to able enable more affordable housing. You know, so uh, anyway, Alex, I think it's an interesting thing you bring forward, and, and I think we should look at it. Okay, Alex, and then Representative Gonzalez. Thanks. Um, I just, uh, at some point, if Ellen could share her screen and show the covenants and conditions section, I just wanted to point out that at least what was in the earlier strike all and in the Senate version um, was not specific to ADUs, was not specific to a particular section of 4412. In fact, um, what it says is that uh, these deed restrictions, covenants, and similar agreements um, that prohibit land development allowed by municipal bylaws shall not be valid. So it, it to um, Representative Kalaki and Hango's point, um, it, it would be a very broad um, uh, piece of legislation that would basically say any municipal, uh, any municipally uh, regulated land development um, could not be prohibited by a deed restriction, a covenant or a binding agreement if you were to remove the phrase that said that the municipality had to first adopt a bylaw in accordance with uh, 4412B, which you've removed. Um, I, from my standpoint, I use the, the accessory dwelling unit as the example of why this could be helpful um, and the specific situation in my community where a resident was prohibited from, from creating one due to their homeowners association restrictions. There are other provisions of municipal land development bylaws allowances that homeowners um, should have access to like home occupations um, that covenants in homeowners associations could also restrict. But I respect Representative Hango's concern and, and also Representative Kalaki's suggestion. So if the, if the committee's interested at all in putting this back in and wants to um, make it much more specific, not all municipal um, regulated land development, but specific to ADUs, um, I, I, that would be fine. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that originally this bill wasn't specific to a particular type of land use like ADUs. It was more, it was broader than that. Alex, I'm sorry. 
But what are you suggesting to take out here? Um, Alex is right. I was wrong. So the provision set. Uh, so this is the language. Um, it was in section four. So it's adding new language to Title 27, which is the property law title. So deed restrictions, covenants, or other similar, similar binding agreements added after, and we would have to update the date, that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under the municipal bylaws in a municipality that has adopted a bylaw in accordance with 4412 shall not be valid. So what I would do is I would strike the reference um, probably about here. So it would um, that so have adopted a restrictive uh, a deed restriction that prohibits or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under the municipal bylaws shall not be valid. So. Uh, or I could put in there a specific reference to ADUs or as Alex suggested, it could just be um, l any land development that uh, would, uh, any, yes. land, in any land development currently allowed by municipal bylaws. And this still allows municipal control. Yes, so this okay. is, so the, the purpose of this language is to prevent from private owners from overriding what the municipality has adopted in their bylaws. And to be clear, line 13 on this page says at, well, line 12 and 13 says after July 1, 2020. So you're talking about not rewriting these restrictions, covenants, or binding agreements to places that already have them. Right, and that's important because otherwise we're um, entering into unconstitutional contract clause territory. So right. um, if we if we say that it's prospective moving forward, saying that new uh, new covenants and deeds can't contain these things, that avoids any um, unconstitutional issue. Yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you, Representative Gonzalez. Uh, so I think that uh, this is a really great catch um, to include this language that it um, we have heard um, not that much this biennium, but in, in previous years and bienniums, different issues that have popped up with homeowners associations. And, uh, and so having something going forward, really looking at the municipal land ordinances are what is, um, what is the law, then we are supporting that and not allowing um, a, a extra government, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think about how to, how to phrase it exactly, but these non-governmental um, uh, organizations to determine land use when that is the role of the municipalities and, and the state. And so I think that this, um, this is a, a great addition to, to the bill and wanna um, echo Representative Kalaki's um, sentiment about that uh, we've, by taking out the pieces of this bill overall that have, um, that we've really struggled with, uh, that I'm, I'm really glad that we are able to, to get across the line some, um, or we, at least we have in front of us, and it seems likely um, because these are things that we have not, that have not been contentious in our committee, um, that we can, can move a lot of really important things forward, particularly around the allowing municipalities to regulate short-term rentals if they need to and allowing ADUs to um, be more possible. So um, I just wanna, wanna say I'm very excited that we have a, a path forward. Representative Hango then by Rome. Um, I guess my question um, would be for the chair, when you rewrote this, what were you thinking um, by not including this language? Um, my eyes focused right on the, the 4412 language that this was specific to um, that this was specific to uh, the language that we're cutting. But as Alex mentioned, when we talked about this on Thursday, 
and we were going through the sections I had said, I had said, um, well, this has to do with 4412. Um, and so we should cut it. And he basically said the same thing he just said today, which was actually, no, this can be useful for these purposes. And so, you know, last night when I was, when I was, um, communicating with Ellen, I just reverted back to my focus on the 4412 and not on the broader issue. So I guess my question then is um, something that I've asked in the past before, and I don't mean it with any disrespect whatsoever, but we normally, when we're sitting in our committee room, have committee members at the table and witnesses are, when they're called on, will offer suggestions. This almost feels like we're all sitting around the same committee table offering ways to build this bill, ways to write this bill. And that that sometimes confuses me. And this this is really confusing the issue for me as well. So I'm I'm trying to understand where this is coming from. And I, I will ask for at least overnight to give this some thought before we make any decisions on this. Um, because there are a number of other planners who are not weighing in on this new language that I would like to hear from. Thank you. Representative Byron. Hmm. I, I think this is for Alex more than anyone else. Um, to the section we were just discussing, could you give me like a, like a, what a scenario like this would play out like? Like give me like a real life sort of anecdotal story. Right, so I can give you an example of a, of a development that was approved um, in 2010, uh, and that was a 37 unit housing development, pretty much all single family homes with a couple of duplexes, and um, they had commonly owned roads and infrastructure. And as a result, as that project was winding its way through our local development review process and also through Act 250, uh, they prepared homeowners association documents that included covenants and, and restrictions. Um, we, we tend not to pay a whole lot of attention to those, except that we want to make sure that the commonly owned uh, infrastructure is properly managed um, and that sort of thing. Um, in that process, uh, the, the developer uh, in those association documents uh, prohibited accessory dwelling units, accessory apartments. Um, sort of got past us. We probably would have asked about the, why that was necessary if, if we had thought about it at the time, but it, we didn't. Um, that project was approved and built. Um, and the first house that was built in that project was the largest house. It was, um, I believe, over 3,000, um, 3,500 square feet. Um, it was designed with a basement that just lent itself to a separate entrance and perhaps an accessory apartment. But the, the original owners didn't use it or desire to use it in that way. Um, they passed away and sold the house and the new owner saw that space as, as a potentially advantageous accessory apartment. So they came to us for a permit to do that. And we said, absolutely, the state requires us to allow that and our regulations make that possible. Here's your zoning permit, go, go make that accessory apartment. Subsequently, the homeowners association um, found out about that and, and approached that homeowner and said, I'm sorry, we have a deed, a deed restriction that says you, you cannot have an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and they nearly went to court over it, but in the end, the homeowner who was interested in creating it backed down and said, well, I got my town permit, but I guess I, didn't, I can't do it because of our, our covenant and restriction. So that's a real example that happened mm -hmm. going forward if we were to have a new development proposed, which in my community, Hinesburg, we have several um, that are right now that proposed a similar restriction, we would probably question it. But if push came to shove and, and the homeowners association um, wanted that restriction in place, um, it would be valid. And our idea of accessory dwelling units in particular, or more broadly, things like um, minor home occupations, other sorts of land development that we encourage and allow for, um, could be overruled, the ability to do that could be overruled by a covenant or, or a restriction within that neighborhood. Okay, no, that kind of just mapped everything out for me and I know I appreciate that, thank you. 
Representative Hengo. Thank you. This is a question that I had before, but I forgot it and now I've remembered it. Thank you, Alex. Um, my question is for a homeowners association, wouldn't they have had to have discussions with the municipality early on when they were forming the HOA and writing their covenants and deeds? And that was something that was agreed upon at the beginning, at the outset of that development? So no, actually normally um, review of deed restrictions and covenants comes towards the end of a development review process. Um, uh, at least in Heinsburg, we do, we do look at those, but um, we, we look at them for very prescribed reasons having to do with shared infrastructure and potential infrastructure that might be taken over by the municipality at a later date, roads, for example. Um, we don't tend to go into a lot of detail about what color you can paint your house or um, you know, when, the, when the association will meet, what their schedule is and that sort of a thing. Um, if this provision were uh, included in statute, it would be clear to both developers, homeowner associations and municipalities that certain types of restrictions um, are, aren't allowed as a part of a homeowner, a new homeowners association, specifically those related to land development, which has a very specific definition um, in the planning and zoning statute. So it would not restrict the ability of a homeowner association to um, prescribe certain types of design, architectural design and the like, um, but it would have the, it would have the result of, of not allowing a homeowner association to um, overrule or supersede a municipal local a municipal's uh, bylaw when it comes to things like accessory dwelling units, home on, home occupations, and other forms of land development. So I guess I didn't ask the question clearly because that didn't answer it clearly for me. My question is um, about the process before a municipality allows a homeowners association to begin building. Um, of course, they're going to take a look at where the roads are, how big the lot sizes are, those types of things. It's, it behooves a, a municipality to know that information before granting permission to an association to build. Um, I'm not concerned about colors of houses or when the meetings are, but I am concerned that right now um, a developer could not just come in and announce that they're going to build a development and have their own covenants without um, having the development review board approve that in a municipality. Is that correct? Um, it, it depends to be perfectly honest. Uh, there are cases, at least there have been in my community where uh, existing developments have introduced their own new homeowners association to govern them we don't review those or have any purview over those. New developments, oftentimes that involve a homeowner association will submit their draft bylaws for us to review. But unless our regulations specify what is and isn't allowed in a homeowner's association bylaw, um, all we can do is suggest and, and encourage them to have bylaws that will work for the future and reflect what's possible based on the municipal bylaw and the state goals for, for housing and planning. Um, so yeah, so it depends is my answer. Sorry, it could not be more specific than that. Now that's making it a little clearer for me. Um, I, I guess I feel like a, an HOA should have their bylaws, maybe not their bylaws, they should have their deeds um, approved by the local municipality in which they are building or incorporating. And um, I think that the municipality should be looking at those types of, of items. But if it's okay with the municipality, then we're back into that cookie cutter scenario where if it's okay with one municipality, then that's fine. Um, every municipality should be able to make their own their own judgments and um, decisions about an organization building in their community. So I guess that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. 
Um, is Chris Cochran available? He had a bad internet connection. Um, Chris, as you know, works for DHCD. Um, and if you could, if you could just tell us about this section and 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 how it's been vetted and how we've talked about it or how that's been talked about in the Senate anyway. Yeah, um, Chris Cochran from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, this provision was introduced back in January, and at the time, um, it was much more broad. Um, various stakeholders got involved, um, uh, Vermont Bankers Association, um, the Title Association, they're a state house representative, um, um, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, a &R, all these people who, who have easements or concerns about titles um, um, stepped in to shape this bill. Um, they made it prospective um, and they thought the intent was good. Um, the Yeah, he just you're fading it. You're fading it. In sense. Sense. Um, sorry, uh, I, I'm not sure we hear. Um, I do think this change does make some sense, and I would urge the the committee to um, to include adding this back to the bill. Um, Earhart. Sorry. Yeah, I am. And uh, apologies, I don't have uh, access to video for some reason today. Um, just, you know, having heard the discussion, you know, I'm not sure it's it's resolved. Um, but just as a broader context, I mean, uh, you know, condominium association uh, bylaws have been used uh, specifically in the past to, to discriminate. Um, and so there are certainly things that uh, need to be in, in, in statute that, um, that overrule. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly um, aware, at least anecdotally, of uh, condominium association rules um, that existed up until not too terribly long ago, weren't enforced, but that violated fair housing law. So uh, just to provide that little bit of broader context uh, to some interplay between um, you know, association bylaws and, and what may be in, uh, you know, in, in, in statute and uh, whether it's local, local ordinance or, or in statute. Okay. Thank you um, for that clarification. I mean, I think that this is um, also because it's perspective. Um, it's really, you know, it's not, I hate to use the phrase because it's so loaded right now, but you know these other folks, everyone else is is um, is grandfathered in. Um, there's a grandfather clause here, um, and as we know, that's a very distinct exclusion, um, and so it protects the rights of people who have already created these things. Ellen, on this issue, it says July 1, 2020. Um, does that have to be shifted to a date certain in the future? So it, um, so that's a date that we could say, um, well, we could say December 1st, we can say January 1st, we can say whatever um, on that. So can you propose, um, can you um, add this to the proposed um, strike all? with the date of um, what are, are people comfortable with um, uh, October 1st or December 1st or January 1st? I like January 1st in case things are in development, it gives people some time, but. So from January 1st on, any new homeowners associations would be subject to this um, provision. Okay. Okay. And um, all right, any further questions on any of the other sections? Or this, this, it's 2.30, I wanna be careful, I would be respectful of our time because um, we're gonna be back with the Adjutant General at three. And um, I think that, uh, so for tomorrow morning we have um, on the schedule we have a conversation with on S254, which is a um, um, public sector union bill, um, but we will not have Damien here until 9 a.m. 
And so um, I would um, ask that if Ellen, if you can, if you can create um, the strike all with the suggestions that we've made here and provide that to the committee at some point this afternoon um, that I would propose also that we have uh, a vote on this tomorrow morning at 8.30 or between 8.30 and nine. Any comments about that? Any, any further comments on this bill? Uh, just my support for the idea. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so with that, let's take a short break. Um, Y'all can leave your computers on if you want. The um, uh, when we're finished here, looks like Peggy is our host again. Um, so Peggy will um, Peggy, if you can just take us off of YouTube right now. So thank you everybody. Thank you to the witnesses.